Kim Delwich, and this is Teaching Through Technology, a continuing series that highlights classroom uses of technology, from chalkboards to electronic whiteboards, drawing tables to drawing software, Teachers have always adapted technology tools to help their students learn. With technology changing faster than ever before, educators are challenged to integrate these new tools into their teaching in meaningful ways. In each program, teachers will share their ideas and techniques for using a wide variety of technology tools to enhance learning for all their students. In this program, we'll meet educators at three middle schools where technology is being integrated into different subject areas. At Lombardi Middle School, we'll see how students use real-time data sent back from NASA's Lunar Prospector. At Lac du Flambeau School, we'll visit the Library Media Center, Computer Class, and the Aquaculture Lab and hear how a media cart brings audiovisual, computer, and internet resources into the classrooms. But first, let's visit Unalaska Middle School where Dan King teaches an innovative course called Multimedia Lab to all 7th and 8th graders. Students in his course learn to use a multimedia approach to accessing and communicating information and put it all together in a final Hyper Studio project. Dan explains the idea behind his course and his curricular objectives. This class is just really a strictly a technology class. It's very much different from any other kind of core academic class. Uh, it's a class, I think, that, that we teach a skill that students can use in their other classes. The objectives of the class are, first of all, to give students an opportunity to be hands-on with some of the newer technologies that are out there. Um, another one of the objectives we have, and I would say it's kind of the overlaying objective we have, and that is for students to work with information in, in three ways. To access the information, uh, meaning to get it, to research it, find it, to analyze that information, picking it apart, taking the part that they need, and finally putting it all together and communicating with it. Another one of our objectives here in this classroom, I think, is to get kids to work in groups. The whole group concept uh, is real, real important, I think, and, and later in life. Kids have to, you have to work together as a team to get a job done. Also, we're trying to get away from the traditional one-on-one -on -one with the computer. You know, there are seven computers in this classroom, about three to four students at a station, and uh, basically, you know, it's up to them to work in that team to get that job done. We're hoping that the students think differently about research, think differently about information, think differently about information resources that are out there to them, and also think differently of how they will create a final project. We want to teach them that technology is out there to make gathering those resources a lot easier for them, um, and putting together a production and communicating what they've learned. They do that with technology, and that's what we're trying to teach kids in here. Dan describes the process the students go through and some of their final projects. The eventual goal of the students near the end of the uh, semester is to communicate, and they communicate via the HyperStudio programs. They have done all this collection of, of, of words and sound and video and music, and uh, they put it together in this HyperStudio production. Uh, the choral one was an example, and uh, fabulous, uh, just a nice job. Uh, lots of music, lots of interaction, uh, with that uh, uh, activity, lots of places to click, lots of videos to see. Um, it really makes learning about coral interesting. There's no doubt about it. Do a freeze frame of that. Re rewind it again. And I let them choose um, a topic of their interest just to start out. These, this group of kids, are uh, that's what they I mean. They skateboard. They know all about it. They did research, they got the pictures, they got skateboard videos, they put the skateboard music in, and the whole production was just fantastic. They were really motivated because that was their interest. The Iditarod is one of those examples where, where students uh, from last semester have learned the multimedia technique and the use of the equipment in this classroom, and now one of our eighth grade units here is doing this unit-wide project on the Iditarod where they make uh, sleds, they do skits, they, they do all sorts of things. And, and, and one of the uh, things that they could do was multimedia projects this year, since this is new. So I had several groups of students come in, and uh, they got pictures of the dogs, they got videos, 
Uh, they, they called people on the telephone that, that, who are mushers, um, and they put together a Hype Studio project, a multimedia project, with um, the Iditarod in mind. And they're going to present that at the same time everybody else presents their projects. They had a good time with it, and they couldn't wait to come back in and make a project um, with something right out of their own curriculums and units. Dan sees a number of benefits to both students and teachers. We're seeing kids take the knowledge that they learn, apply it in other subject areas. The teachers, the staff here has been supportive. Uh, they allow the students to, to do projects electronically. They have their choice whether you know, they can use the multimedia approach that they learn or uh, doing it uh, uh, more traditionally. I guess one of the unexpected things that, that happen with this uh, multimedia lab is that some of the students that uh, typically haven't done so well in the other classrooms or perhaps have been behavior problems or something have, have come into this room and have just totally taken off with it. I think because they do not have to sit and listen for 40 minutes in a traditional class, they can come in here maybe listen for a little bit of instruction and hands-on work with it and be creative. The kids that they're with model appropriate uh, behaviors, model appropriate use of the computers, and it catches on. I've had a lot of kids that started out thinking that no way they're going to be able to do this, and by the end of the semester, um, they're doing it just as well as the rest of the group. There have also been barriers to overcome along the way. The first barrier, I guess you could say, of course, is money. It's like, where do you get the money for this sort of thing? We sat down and we got the idea to write a WATF grant. That's a Wisconsin Advanced Telecommunications Foundation grant. And we wrote it up. We had never written a grant before. We put this together, and by golly, we got this. And uh, it, was, it was exciting. So in terms of barrier, the money all of a sudden now is there. The next barrier is you know, structurally, how do you put this together? How do you make this work? And then the next one is, OK, I have students for two classes per week for, sem for a semester, 36 classes a year. How do you get everything done in that amount of time? How do you go from access to communicate in 36 class periods? So far, that's been working out. Some days, we really move in, in, in here to get it done. But uh, overall, it's been working out. Again, we're, we're still pretty new at it, and we're still learning. There's conflicts and softwares and that sort of thing that we have to work with, but uh, again, we're fine-tuning that, and that seems to be working out pretty well. Um, those are the typical conflict things that you're going to get in a computer classroom. Um, you know, I, I wondered how the groups would work. I mean, these are 13 and 14-year-old kids, three and four. They're you know, uh, and and that's been working out well. They they're they're seated. You know, we designed the furniture so that there's enough space for them. And also, too, along with the computers, there's a television and VCRs, and there's scanners in the classroom, and there's things like that. So all of them could use that and access that. All four of them would stay pretty busy. Dan explains how the Multimedia Lab came about and how it fits in the district's technology plan. We got started doing this. Uh, it was kind of uh, interesting. Uh, about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, we were at um, a technology conference, a state technology conference, and uh, myself, uh, uh, the principal here, another one of our staff members here, uh, were kind of brainstorming ideas on what, uh, you know, what we could do, how could we increase technology, how can we you know, set up a model situation uh, here in the school that students could take um, so that they could be taught a skill that they can be used in other areas. And um, the idea just got, got going. We got the idea of moving away from the traditional one-on-one -on -one with the keyboard into groups, into multimedia, uh, you know, approach, uh, and try to teach them a skill that they can use in a lot of situations. We try to fit all the goals along with that plan, along with this classroom, and it does. And uh, our, a lot of our instructional technology goals have to do with bringing uh, more technology to students, um, bringing the technology to the students closer as instead of the students to the technology, teaching them ways to use it teaching them a skill in technology that they can use in their other classes. Dan's advice for other schools who would like to institute something like this? My advice would be uh, what, what we did. That's what worked. What we did was we brought the administrators and the school board members to schools that were utilizing a technology, that were doing, they were teaching things in different ways, getting away from the traditional, bringing our superintendent over to a nearby school district that was doing an online project with um, 
a North Pole expedition with uh, Will Steger and, his, and the dogs and the kids were communicating via email to his expedition, pinpointing where he was and that sort of thing. And here was Will Steger, who was a very famous explorer, at the school with the dogs as kind of a final thing. So I brought our administrator to that and that really kind of lit things up a little bit for us. That really worked well. This different way of teaching seems to really work for Dan's students. Next, we travel to Lac du Flambeau, where we'll hear from computer and technology teacher Dan Gross and library media specialist Julie Vanderloo. But first, Administrator Dick Vaught explains the philosophy behind his school's technology use. It's important as a vertical equity tool. It's important to give students access to information, and I think that's what education is about. You could go through every school in the state and with 95% accuracy tell how the students are going to score by the income level of their parents. Students do not come to school at the same level. Students come to school at different levels. So with technology, it, it sort of evens the playing field, I think. We have five computers in every classroom and uh, two computer labs, and we're finding that it's helping the students with their writing skills and uh, getting sources of information. The computer's not going to replace a teacher. It's an, a source of information. We have to remember that. And it's equally important to have the teachers trained in utilizing it. We can have the technology but it's to utilize the technology properly as a source of information. Julie outlines how she introduces technology to middle school students in the Library Media Center. I teach a library science class. The children are required to write a research paper. In the beginning of the class, we do some heavy duty reviewing of reference skills. From there, we go into choosing a topic, and then they resource their topic and write the paper. We use technology in the library as a resource. We have 10 computers in the library. They're all hooked up and onto the web. The children can use the internet as a source. We have Encyclopedia Online and um, our catalog is also on the computer system. The kids really enjoy this. They love looking up things in the internet. It expands their reach dramatically. We've got kids here from Lac de Flambeau who have been on the internet talking to kids from France and Germany and Russia, you know, everywhere. Once they realize what is at their fingertips, they get very excited. We do limit some things on the internet, of course, that are inappropriate. And the kids know this and sign a contract here at school um, stating they will not go to places on the net that they don't belong. According to Julie, another innovative tool has been quite popular at Lac du Flambeau. Our media center has just recently purchased this media cart, put it together, and we've demonstrated it to the teachers so they can use it in their classrooms for lesson plans and everyday activities. The cart contains a computer with a CD-ROM, a VCR, and also a special projector. A teacher may go onto the internet, and what is on the monitor they can project onto a larger screen, such as a TV or a wall screen. They can also put in a CD and have that come up. Or they can use the VCR with a tape. Or they can integrate the three of them by switching back and forth when they need to. The teachers check it out just as they would any other material. It encourages learning. These children are so excited about the different technologies that we're using. And when they see a teacher bring in a cart like that and start surfing the net and then going into CD programs, the kids themselves get excited and they want to know more about it. Julie finds that using technology involves both advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantages to technology is the rapid movement of it. Sometimes we can order something in six months or a year from now, it's going to be obsolete. And so that can be a disadvantage. You really have to be careful about what you order and choose to purchase at your school. The benefits of teaching with technology, first and foremost, would be how exciting it is. It's very interesting. It um, sure beats the old standards of the teacher standing up and lecturing to the students and having the students just retain that information, hopefully. This way, it's more of a hands-on task it's exciting for the teacher because we get to use so many different materials because there's so many new things out there and the children get to see these new materials. Technology is a great thing because it allows us to teach in various ways. 
every student does not learn in the same way. We have visual learners, audio learners, and hands-on learners. And by using technology, you're able to hit each one of these different categories. And so it's really nice to be able to know that you're reaching out to each student and their different capabilities. Computer teacher Dan Gross describes some of the other technology applications that enrich the middle school curriculum. Actually, technology has become quite important to, uh, to Lacta Flambeau uh, in the last couple of years. We have the kids doing uh, research papers, designing home pages. We do quite a bit uh, with groups like our um, Tech Ed, which was formerly a shop class. And our science teacher, Mr. Grams, um, is running an aquaculture program. He has several large fish tanks, and not just glass fish tanks. These are great big fish tanks. Right now they're, they're raising tilapia, it's a white fish, and as part of the eighth grade fundraising, they have to care for the fish. They take care of them. When the fish are mature, they actually fillet them, they package them, they sell them uh, to people who are interested, and then they use that money for their uh, eighth grade trips. They have to measure the fish, they have to keep track of how much food they give them, the water conditions, they have to chart that all on the computer. In addition to the aquaculture and uh, using the computers that way, they also do the same thing with uh, greenhouse and uh, they have a, a growing program that they do back there. The life skills teacher, she uses the materials that they grow in the greenhouse uh, in her classroom as well. I had a chalkboard in here for the first year and decided I didn't like the dust. I had a whiteboard that I had pinned up to one of my side walls and decided that I just didn't care for that much either and I've since painted the, uh, the concrete black wall white and we use the, um, the projection on the wall as the chalkboard. Once again, once you've got H colon and then the name, go ahead and click the save button and it'll save to your home directory. I've used the email in the past also to keep track of assignments. And the nice thing about doing that is that when the students aren't here, they still get the assignments. They still get them as soon as they log in, they, as soon as they check their email. Uh, they're able to do that. So I've, I've addressed not having a blackboard in many of those ways and I don't miss it at all. <laughs> One of the things that we're trying to change uh, around here is to get technology more into the hands of the students. One of the reasons they don't have it is because the money just isn't in the community uh, for the parents to buy the, the technology for their kids. We offer open uh, lab after school for both parents and students. Three nights a week we have open lab for two hours and anybody who wants to come is welcome to come in. Often on the weekends we'll open up the, the computer lab for the older students and, and we'll, we'll play multiplayer games and, and things like that with the adults. Dan describes how the district technology plan attempts to overcome some of the problems they have encountered. I would say the biggest problem we've probably had um, has not been from the administration or the teachers but the technology itself, getting the technology to work. Very often we're one of the first schools that they have that are trying to do new things. So I think that's been one of the most difficult things is trying to um, keep the old stuff working with the new stuff and explore things that are new and exciting. We plan so that every four years a quarter of our material is going to be obsoleted and replaced so that we always have something that can do the newest and neatest things that we need it to do but we always have some of the old stuff around as well. It's just not always in the right places so making sure that the right technology is in the right places is probably the the most difficult thing we've had to overcome. Finally, Dan outlines some of the benefits these tools can generate for both students and teachers. One of the things the computer uh, allows us to do is to provide many different individualized types of instructions for the student. So if one student uh, perhaps learns best auditorily, we might provide something like the Robert Frost poems being read to them and a student can go back and listen to a passage over and over and over again. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two worlds diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. One of the neat things about being connected and being on the internet and having email is that um, everyone talks to everyone. The amount of material that we've been able to bring into the building, new ideas, things that we've been able to um, integrate into the curriculum have just been amazing, fantastic. It's been one of the best uh, investments for us. While technology helps connect these rural students with the rest of the world, educators in Green Bay are using it to take their students to the moon. In our next segment, Sue Thino of the Einstein Academy, Craig Dickman of the Space Explorer's NASA Outreach Project, and sixth grade teacher Tony Birkin of Lombardi Middle School 
explain how the Moonlink project enhances the science curriculum. Moonlink is a program designed to allow students to participate in the Lunar Prospector mission, which is a NASA spacecraft mission, from their own classrooms. So there's actually three parts to Moonlink. The first part is the education materials and the background work so they understand what Prospector is doing, the science, the exploration, and what we're trying to learn from the Prospector satellite being in orbit. Then they work and perform as a mission team, mirroring the, near, the, the real positions with NASA, taking on those roles, and in a simulated sense, they launch the spacecraft then and are able to get it in lunar orbit. Once they get the spacecraft in lunar orbit then, then they have the opportunity to start seeing some real data come down from the spacecraft. And so there they get a chance to feel what it's like to be part of a mission team, what it's like to train and participate in a real space mission. The third part of Moon Link then, and the program that the students were involved with today, involves researching a spot on the moon that they select. Uh, the students will select a unique 150 kilometer quadrant on the moon and from there they'll have access to data and actually do some of the first research on that location, ultimately reporting their findings to the Lunar Prospector Science Team at NASA's Ames Research Center. So they're actively involved in the mission, getting a sense and a feel for what it's like to participate and will actually be involved in the creation of new knowledge and the information that we'll be learning from the spacecraft uh, that's going to be orbiting the moon for about 18 months. The Einstein Project has joined with the Moonlink Project in um, supplying the space bus or the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder is a school converted school bus that the Bellevue East Town Optimist Clubs uh, had as their project and uh, they needed an educational institution to take it over and so the Einstein Project which in the whole Green Bay area here is math and science and technology for the school districts we took on the Pathfinder and uh, put together a committee that to put some curriculum together. The goal is really to have like 12 laptop computers on board that can hook up to the internet, um, have the activities prepared ahead of time for the teachers to use with their students, that it's a place where the students are there to learn and to meet the space standards. We're actually going to simulate the launch of the lunar prospector that would allow us to look at the surface of the moon, which is full of craters. So. We're really trying to find out what caused those craters and, and what speed was the particular projectile moving at and what kind of impact did it have. So we gathered data that allowed us to do that. We're going to get a certain section of the moon that we can actually gather data from. Tony and Sue identify some of the merits in using technologies with students. It allows us to do so many more things that we can't do in the classroom with the materials that we have there. It also allows students to be problem solvers with some high-tech equipment. The biggest benefit, I think, in terms of uh, the knowledge they gain, it also is the fact that they have to work as a team to solve a problem. Problems are not solved in isolation. Uh, problems are not solved without, without information. So the, the, the more people we have involved in gathering data and collecting information, the better opportunity we have to, to solve problems. Technology provides us with a variety of different techniques of, of solving problems and gathering data and analyzing data? Well, first of all, it's exciting for kids. And it kind of gets all that curiosity going. And with the technology, they can search everywhere. You know, they have the world open to them. Uh, if they need to know something, they have websites they can go to to find things out. Uh, not only are they using the technology, but they're also talking to each other about what's going on. And it's just an exciting way to learn. Tony also cites some drawbacks he has found. I think one of the disadvantages is trying to get your hands on some of that material. Uh, computers are wonderful technology, but yet they're very expensive. Uh, we have computers at our school and, and youngsters use them, but yet it's very hard to get computer time all the time. Another disadvantage certainly would be having the necessary training to use that material. And you have to have some people who are pretty well versed in the technology in order to be, have it used appropriately. According to Tony, technology can help teachers reach students with different needs. There's a lot of learning styles out there today with those young people and the technology I think allows a lot of those students to build on their strengths. Some of them are very visually oriented and when you have a computer screen in front, of the, in front of them, it allows them to, to learn much more readily because they're visually oriented. Uh, there is also communication going on between the people. Some are auditory learners, and that certainly has an effect on their learning also. 
So I, I, I think any time you involve technology, you address a whole variety of different learning styles at one time. I think with at-risk students, if you can identify the learning style, and if you can then use that particular learning style in your classroom, it's very beneficial. So if a youngster is comfortable with technology and has information about how to use that technology and has the technology available to him and is, for example, a visual learner, that can be very effective, very effective. And I've seen that with students who are learning disabled and certainly with students who are emotionally disturbed. If we can design the curriculum according to the student's learning style, success will then happen. We, we can have those youngsters learn. Green Bay Assistant Superintendent Daniel Nirad joins Sue and Tony to discuss some changes in teaching and the role technology can play. Well, I think one of the things that we, we know today is that uh, school districts will have a common set of standards for all students. And the curriculum should be common in terms of what we expect students to know and be able to do. But how students learn and how uh, teachers teach to those standards can be very different. And what technology does is it recognizes, first of all, it's a tool. We have uh, old time tools as well, you know, the pencil, the typewriter, the word processor, and others that we use. So we don't want the technology to replace good instruction. What it does is it recognizes students that are better able at solving problems by using their, their hands and, and actually uh, using a scientific method. And that, that can happen with very young children uh, in this new type of science uh, uh, curriculum. All of science is really moving out of what the traditional role was where the teacher stood in the front and lectured. Science in particular is all hands-on, minds-on, inquiry-centered where the students ask the questions and their curiosity sparks that learning that they want to find out the answer. Make a prediction and see if your prediction is right. Technology just adds to that. They still have to uh, explore things on their own. They have to ask questions, but it's a way to find some answers. There's been a real movement of education, especially in, in areas of science, with the new standards and benchmarks. There's been a real thrust so you guys on inquiry learning. So and technology them. allows us, it permits us as educators okay. to have the students Good. use inquiry right. in the learning process. The educators you've seen today are demonstrating a medley of ways to use new tools to enhance teaching and learning. By experimenting with these technologies, they're discovering different ways to teach and relate to their students. We hope this program has sparked your imagination and added a few new images to your vision of teaching through technology. If you would like more information about teaching through technology or any of the projects featured in this program, please contact the Wisconsin Educational Communications Board.